Despite the poverty that assaulted him from every corner of the empire's second largest city, Joseph Cantwell had something to inspire him, a raging idealism and optimism for the future of his country and his class. Over the next few years, he would become part of the most tumultuous period in recent Irish history. He wanted to be a, a radio officer. Yes. In order to earn his fees, he fought in a, as a boxer in a, a place in Pierce Street, which was called the Ancient Concert Room, yeah. where they put up prize fighters, you know. And th that way he earned his uh, fees for college to go to radio school. There was 11 children, but only nine of them survived. The children died those days from the flu because there were no antibiotics or nothing like that, and consumption, all those things. They had a hard life, and uh, he saw no assistance from anywhere. The government didn't care about anyone. What is most striking about the living conditions in Dublin in the early 20th century is the sheer abject poverty in which so many of the people of the city lived. Housing was extremely poor, sanitation was extremely poor, the death rate was incredibly high, the numbers of children who died in childbirth and in the early years of their lives was incredibly high. His father was a carpenter uh, and uh, they were obviously fairly, they wouldn't have been rich. Like thousands of others, Joseph became infatuated with trade unionism. He turned his passion into a career when he turned 18 becoming a clerk for the Irish Transport and General Workers Union, the largest union in the United Kingdom. He worked for Irish Transport and General Workers Union. Their uh, periodical was called The Voice of Labour, which uh, campaigned against the establishment. He was more, he was a socialist, you know, out and out socialist, in the, the vein of the great socialist thinkers in England and that. Like, he was, he was more than just a trade unionist. Joseph Cantwell was a very talented artist and pianist. He became friends with Constance Markovich and George Russell through the art school on Kildare Street. Joseph would accompany them on artist retreats to the Wicklow Hills. This is a photo of Joseph showing his artwork to Maurice McGonade, Manus Miller, S. Slater and Dermot O'Brien. This picture demonstrates Joseph's shyness as he hides behind his work bashfully. In order to uh, embellish all this effort, he used his ability as an artist to do all these beautiful cartoons, making you know, political points and critical points of the government. The IRA had set up their own government, their own internal government in exile, you know, and uh, they were still fighting uh, the British here. And he he uh, set up a receiver in his house in in his old home, and with the copper wire strung out along the back and. Which, which was a, supposedly a clothesline. You know. when, it, when the British government, I, I presume the War Office, would send a signal, would signal the, the Dublin Castle here, which was the, the centre of British power then, uh, he would get the signal at the same time. And uh, I think this is how Collins broke the, the military code. Joseph's cartoon work is very artistic and gentle, and his passion for politics and Ireland are represented in both. The first one demonstrates his belief in the Irish Republican power, showing Father Time promising a brighter future to the young Labour man. They were all in black and white, there was no colour then, you know, but they were really beautifully done. The second cartoon demonstrates a change of heart in Joseph's political position, as it discusses taxes that were imposed by the Irish government after the Civil War, and demonstrates his lack of respect for the movement that he once fought for. So one or two cartoons I remember. Do you remember there was one um, of Bill O'Brien? And um, <laughs> Bill O'Brien is, uh, he has given his employees a, a very hard time and it's Christmas time. And you just see Bill O'Brien, a big fat man with a big plum pudding on yeah. the table yeah. <laughs> and a turkey and everything. In the meantime, his workers were starving. You know? <laughs> Did some more artistic work for uh, a very famous magazine called the Dublin Opinion. He did quite a number for them because I think he knew the owner of it. Yeah, uh, Charles Kelly. He was a friend, yeah. There was nothing to us at home to see him doing cartoons on the table and stuff like that. 
When you look back at the cartoons of the revolutionary period, what is most striking about them is their brilliance, how evocative they were of certain sent sentiments, how they could shape sentiment, as well as reflect the views that were held by the people uh, who drew them and the people who watched them. The new government had come in, you know, and they were interested in setting up the national health. So they seconded him from the union to set it up for the government. Uh, he, he was working there for I don't know how many years, but finally he decided to go out on his own. So he bought a shop. Joseph lost interest in Irish politics, but he never lost his idealism. Joseph's life tells one of many stories that demonstrate the fight to take back human rights of the new Irish generation. His passion suggests that there was more than just nationality to the struggle of independence, it was also fueled by the favour of fairness, quality and the justification of civil liberties for all.